Hey guys, so it's been a couple of months now since we tested out the Acertec Invicta prototype pedals which we've actually been running on the rig for all of our racing content ever since we did that first look video. So now we have the retail version of the uh, throttle and brake as well as the clutch module. We're going to be checking them out in detail today to see how they vary from our initial impressions on the prototype pedals and giving you a good overall picture of whether these are going to be the pedals for you. So let's get started. Now, before we get started today, just want to quickly run you through a couple of important housekeeping things. Firstly, thank you very much to Acetech SimSports for sending these pedals across to us to check out today. Now, you may have noticed if you've been watching our other content here on the channel that they have been sponsoring some of our racing content over recent weeks. Now, we have a very clear policy when it comes to the separation between sponsorship of any other type of content and sponsorship of review videos. Obviously, we would never allow a brand or a competitor brand to sponsor a review video here on the channel. It just wouldn't make any sense and obviously would be a conflict of interest. Now we have a very clear policy on exactly how we monetize content here at Boosted Media that is linked down in the description below and Acetech Simsports actually have a article as well where they've completely disclosed their position on the matter too. So I would encourage you to read both our website as well as theirs, both linked down in the description. The important thing here is that there's absolutely no conditions on what we can and can't say, what we can and can't cover in today's video. We're absolutely free to say exactly what we think about these pedals, which is of course the way it always should be with any review video. There will also be some affiliate links down in the description below as well. That is an awesome way to help support the channel if you do decide to pick up a set of these pedals at no additional cost to you guys. And if you don't like these pedals and want to go with something else, chances are you can help support the channel with that as well. So the links to all that stuff will all be down in the description. But I think that covers everything we need to in terms of housekeeping. So let's get on and get these guys unboxed. So as I'm sure you figured out by now, this is a modular system. So we have the option for purchasing the throttle and brake. And then if we want to, we also have the option for a clutch as well. And I think that's a really good move. It's actually been really interesting to see a lot of people have actually taken the clutches off their sim rigs since the uh, MX-5 series in iRacing moved from being a H pattern manual to a sequential gearbox. A lot of people just are finding that they're not using clutches anymore. So having the option to not have to spend the extra on a clutch that you potentially won't need or use is a good thing. So just to quickly run you through pricing here, there is an introductory pre-order offer which is in place until the end of February. Make sure you check via the links down in the description below for the most recent information. But as it stands right now, at least at the end of February 2022, the price on the brake and throttle is going to jump from the $699 US dollars that it is now up to $849, so an increase of 18%. And the clutch is going to jump from $299 US dollars and euros up to $349, which is a 4 14% increase. So just be aware of that. If you pre-order before the end of February, as it stands right now, you will uh, receive the cheaper price. So we'll talk a little bit more about pricing and how it compares within the market a little bit later on in today's video. But let's get on now and start by unboxing the brake and throttle. All right, let's get in and do this. Now they have told us that the packaging that they've sent us here isn't completely final. I'm sure the uh, the design will be essentially the same, but the actual finish of the uh, printing and everything is gonna be improved for final production. Not that there's really anything wrong with this the way it stands right now. Now this is all recyclable cardboard as well, just out of interest there too, but let's pop this off now. Slide the cover off. It is very well presented, I gotta say. It is, you know, it, I know it's not important what the box is like, but it is nice to receive something that is well presented. We've got that uh, marketing message similar to what we have with Fanatec products there, no limits. Let's get in here. Performance, precision, passion. Excellence is not a skill, it's an attitude. There you go. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so we've got a couple of USB A to C cables there. We've got Oh, that's nice. I love the uh, signature Invicta logo there. What do we got in here? Paper again, so that's good. No plastic. There we go. There is a little bit of plastic in there just to individually wrap the various components. So that's all of our bits and pieces for mounting, uh, elastomer inserts, T-nuts, and so forth. So we'll run through all of that stuff in just a moment. We're not going to hold up on there for too long now. Just set that down. And then we've got another cardboard insert. There we go. And a sticker sheet. Again, I don't think that this is quite final just yet. So that may change. 
really nicely put together. I'm gonna have to remember how all this went together so I can put the box back together when we're done. I intend to run these pedals on the rig for quite some time. Now I want to be really careful how I lift this out as well. I don't want to lift it from the uh, from the shaft. I might try and go from here. I think. Yeah. There we go. That'll do. All right. Excellent. Let's put the box down on the ground. So let's quickly run through what we get inside the box with the throttle and brake before we move on to unboxing the clutch. So there are a couple of little variances here between what we've got and what you guys will receive in the retail package. Most notably, the lack of an instruction manual here. There is a very detailed instruction manual which they've since uh, emailed through to us. We'll overlay some footage of that here so you can see just how detailed it is. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite ready in time for printing for the uh, review samples that were sent out. But let's run through the other bits and pieces here. We mentioned the sticker sheet briefly before as well. I believe that may be uh, slightly improved in the retail packaging as well, but that doesn't look, I mean, I don't see any problems with it at all the way it stands right now. The gold is maybe a little bit touchy, but anyway, we don't need to spend time on that because it's going to change anyway. Don't need to uh, waste you guys time. A couple of USB cables here. We've got a A to C. The uh, C connection is what is on the uh, side of the pedals, and we'll look at that in detail later on. So we've got a A connection to go to your PC or your hub, and then we've also got a USB C to C connection here as well for those of you who might be running into a more modern motherboard directly or those of you who may be running a USB-C type interface on your hub. So probably not too many people are gonna be using that cable just yet, but I'm glad that they are including that because that is definitely something we're gonna see becoming more common. We get a couple of additional Elastima inserts here. We've got a black soft one. There's a white medium one which is pre-installed and then we've got the green hard setting there as well. And we'll elaborate on those later on as well. We've got a hard throttle spring installed by default and then a softer one as an accessory as well. And then the rest of this is all just tools and hardware. Now, one of the things that I really love about these pedals is they are pretty much toolless in terms of making adjustments on the fly, but obviously they do include a little Allen key here for a couple of grub screws, as well as an Allen key, which is compatible with our M6 mounting bolts, which they do also include. So let's just quickly run through mounting here. This is one thing that I'm really happy to see. They are including some T-nuts here and I actually discussed with their marketing manager at length on, uh, on Facebook Messenger one night exactly what type of T-nuts they should be including here for the most uh, compatibility. And I'm glad to see they have gone with my advice here. So what we have here is leaf spring style T-nuts. Now, some of you might be saying, why didn't they go with spring ball type? The reason for that is that spring ball type ones aren't always compatible with every type of channel that you might have across different types of profiles. So these leaf spring types do tend to be the most compatible. So for those of us who are mounting these pedals directly to profile, this is gonna mean that you can mount them quite easily without the T-nuts sort of sliding around and moving while you're trying to install them. So glad to see that they've gone with that advice there. So then we also have some 20 millimeter long M6 mounting bolts. Those are gonna be long enough to go through the base plate and into those T-nuts in your profile. Or if you're mounting directly to some sort of a pedal plate, then we also have some washers here as well as some nuts which can lock on the back. And those bolts are gonna be long enough to be compatible with those as well, as long as you don't have a super thick pedal plate that you're mounting these to. So everything that you need there to get these pedals mounted on pretty much any type of rig that I can think of is included in the box, which is excellent. Great to see they've taken the time to really understand what people are gonna be needing so you don't have to run down the hardware store unexpectedly. So let's move on now and unbox the clutch. All right, so pretty much exactly the same deal again. You can see the clutch pedal there. We've got the same little box, which I assume is gonna contain more mounting hardware. Okay. Whoop cardboard everywhere. <laughs> oh good, I really do like this packaging. It's very well designed, very well thought out. Nothing's gonna move around and it's all recyclable as well, which is really good. So let's set all that aside. So as with the brake and throttle, we get a couple of T-nuts here, a couple of 20 mil long M6 bolts, a couple of nuts and a couple of washers. So we'll set all of those aside. Now there's a couple of additional things here as well. These are intended for joining the clutch to our brake and throttle. So we've got a couple of little pins here, as well as a couple of grub screws. And I'll show you exactly how we connect those together in just a moment. But I wanna start off here by running through each of these pedal sets individually, go over all the details. And uh, there's also already a couple of things that I've noticed which are a little bit different from the prototypes. So we'll run through all that stuff. And uh, yeah, then we can get into some driving tests. So I know a lot of you guys will have already seen our first look video with the prototype version of these pedals. So what I wanted to quickly do now is run you through the things that have changed between then 
and now, and then we'll go through everything in detail again for those of you who haven't seen that video. So those who have already seen the first look video will then be able to skip forward and not have to watch through the same stuff again. So what we're looking at here is essentially just a, I guess a further refinement overall of what we already saw. In terms of the drivability and the core functionality here, nothing has changed. Everything is pretty much just cosmetic and material changes in addition to a couple of other little bits and pieces just to fine tune a few things. So what we have here is a cast aluminium base plate now, as opposed to the CNC machined base plate that we had previously. Now, the thing that I'm noticing with this is it actually looks better overall than the CNC version did. We can see with this slight gradient that we have here on our heel plate, we don't have the little step marks in the machining anymore like we did with the prototype version. Uh, so that's one thing, it definitely looks better. If we flip the pedals over, you can see now we have a plastic cover which is running over the entire base plate now. So none of the wiring is exposed like it was previously with the exception of just a little area where the, uh, where the clutch plugs in, but we'll cover that later on. Uh, we've got black coating on these little clevis pins now, which we didn't have before. Uh, the little cover here, over the top of our PCB is also proper plastic now instead of 3D printed. We'll cover that in more detail a little later on too. The other important change here is the addition of some little rubber pads underneath our return stoppers for all three of the pedals. Now what that does is it adds a little bit of dampening there so that we don't get that metal to metal contact noise on the pedal return. Now importantly there is still metal to metal contact on the uh, full scale deflection or when you push the pedal down. So it does still clack up against the bolt on the back here when you do that. Now, I've had a little bit of a chat with them about this and look, to be honest with you, I find when I'm using these pedals and I have been running the prototype version without these rubber stops on them on the rig for you know a good couple of months now, I found that when I was pushing the pedals to their maximum, I wasn't tending to notice the noise as much as on the return. It was when I lift, the, lift my foot off the pedal and the pedal comes you know, crashing back to zero, that was when I found the pedals were quite loud to use. And you can hear now, very little sound in there whatsoever. That's perfectly what I would say within an acceptable range for anybody wanting to run the pedals, you know, in a living room or, you know, next to a bedroom or something like that. They're certainly not any louder than any other sim racing pedals that we've seen out there in that regard. Now, the reason they haven't wanted to add a rubber stopper to the bump stop on the, uh, on the push down is because anytime you do that, it's adding a little bit of dead zone into the end of the throw. You can imagine as we're pushing that down, if we have any sort of squishiness at the end of the stroke, then we're going to have to calibrate that out and that's going to ultimately mean that we have to tune back the resolution ever so slightly. So they've opted to not do that. Of course, it would be relatively easy to just stick a little rubber pad on top of that bolt if it is something that bothers you. So it is a very easy fix, but they've opted not to do it and that's the reason why in this case. So we do have little rubber stops there on all three of the pedals now, which deaden the sound. So that was something that I did call out on the prototype pedals. Really happy to see that they have fixed that. And yeah, if we have a look at the clutch as well, I can see exactly the same thing in there. So that is all good. And look, other than that, it really is just small little tiny cosmetic changes. One thing I noticed on the uh, little retainer for the uh, hydraulic cylinder here, the Invicta Thorpe cylinder, that's now got a uh, chamfered edge instead of a solid edge. Just little tiny details like that that have been changed, but nothing major. And that is, yeah, that's literally all that's changed between the uh, prototype and the final version in terms of hardware. Obviously the software has been updated as well, and we'll take a look at that in more detail a little bit later on. But uh, yeah, let's push on now and go through all of the various aspects of these pedals. So let's start out here by talking about adjustment. Now, because of the design of these pedals and how they're affixed to our base plate, we don't have any lateral or longitudinal adjustment in terms of their placement relative to the heel rest. Obviously, you can move them forward and back on your rig though, if you need to do that. Now, we do have forward to back tilt adjustment here. How they preset them from factory is how they recommend you have them set up. And you can see there is a small offset between the uh, brake pedal and the throttle pedal if we look at them directly side on like this. And that is intentional so that when you're heel and towing, you uh, basically where you're pushing the brake to down to the threshold point means that the brake is sitting flush with the throttle and you can then roll your heel across to heel and toe. But we can adjust these. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is the completely toolless adjustment for most of the main things that you're likely to adjust on the fly here. So all you need to do is just loosen this little retainer collar here. And this is the same on all three pedals. And then you can just screw this in or screw it out. And what that does is as you do that, it tilts it in and out. So we're just gonna loosen it off here. Obviously the addition of the little rubber pad in there does make it bind a little bit. So we're just gonna do it like that. And you can see now we've got a much larger offset there. If we screw it back in again, 
back to about where it was, so about there, it's about where it was, and then we can just lock it back in again. So nice and easy there, and we do have quite a decent range of adjustment that you can see. If we go all the way to the minimum, it's gonna sit a little bit ahead, so that's actually a little bit beyond 90 degrees, which I wouldn't recommend. And there is a little bit of slack there in the pedal. It does feel quite sloppy if you have it that loose. So it's not completely flapping around. You can see there is a retainer spring in the base there so that it's not completely loose. So it's not slack, but it just, it just lacks that definition that it had when it was set a little bit tighter. So I wouldn't recommend you have it that loose. About there is good. So we'll lock that down and then you can adjust that all the way down to not that, again, not that you would ever need to do this, but you can adjust it that far in as well. So plenty of range of adjustment there. So the physical adjustment for the angle of the pedal arm is the same across all three pedals. However, there is a couple of additional steps that we need to take for the brake pedal. So you can imagine if we were to make adjustments here to the angle, that's gonna adjust the amount of pressure that we have or the position relative to the push rod on our hydraulic cylinder here. So what we need to do is loosen off our thumb screw, wind that back, Release the clevis pin here, pull the clevis pin out, and then what we'll do is, uh, we actually need to lift that up off the back as well so it's not, uh, not sitting on the ground. So then we can adjust the angle of our pedal to where we need it to be, and then all we need to do is just spin our clevis here into the correct position, line it up again with the hole, and then that will match up with our new pedal position. So simple as that, it's a very easy adjustment there to make just something that you need to be aware of if you are making adjustments to the angle of your brake pedal. So we'll pop that back in again quickly now. Shove the clevis pin back through, pop it down, lock the thumb screw back in position, and that is that done. Now we also have an adjustment here as well. That is to adjust our maximum throw or our full scale deflection. So again, you just loosen off the collar here, loosen the nut, get it adjusted to where you need it, and then lock it down, that's gonna adjust our maximum throw. So if we spin the pedals around this way, so you can see what's happening is this little part of the pedal arm here hits up against that bolt, and that is what gives us our bump stop. Now that's really important because if we have a look over here, there's a little plastic armature with a magnet inside it. Our Hall effect sensor for the throttle pedal is actually sitting underneath the aluminum base plate here. So as that magnet gets closer and further away from the Hall effect sensor, that is what gives us our throttle input detection. So we've got Hall effect sensors on the throttle and the clutch, and then a pressure sensor for the hydraulic cylinder on our brake, which we'll discuss in just a minute. Now the advantage of a Hall effect sensor over a potentiometer is that there's no mechanical moving parts, so it doesn't wear out or you know take in debris and things like that over time. Now, one of the things I've commented on extensively in other pedal reviews that have used potentiometers, potentiometers aren't fundamentally a bad thing by design. We see potentiometers used in critical systems on modern road cars. So a good example of this is our throttle position sensor in a real car, which is the equivalent of what we're doing here. Yeah, that is generally speaking a potentiometer in most cars. Now it's a sealed unit, a weatherproof unit and a dustproof unit. That means it's not gonna take in dirt and debris and they typically do have a very long lifespan. So, you know, potentiometers aren't fundamentally bad, but you know, if you're using a low quality potentiometer, something that's an open design that can take in dust and debris, it is gonna wear out and it is gonna change its input or its reading over time. Whereas something like a Hall Effector sensor is far less likely to, uh, to change over time. Does add a little bit of complexity in terms of the electronics. You do need to have an amplifier circuit to amplify the signal from the Hall Effect sensor. But we have found with the two months that we've been using the prototype pedals, absolutely no issues in variation in signal on any of the inputs on the pedals. It's, you know, we haven't had to adjust anything or recalibrate anything from when we set it up initially in our first look video. And that is of course very important for muscle memory too. The last thing you wanna have to do is routinely recalibrate the pedals and have to reset your muscle memory again. So good choice there with the Hall Effect sensors on the throttle and the clutch. Now in terms of other adjustments across all three pedals, we do have additional holes in the pedal faces. You can see here the spacing between those. This is 15 millimeter spacing. And then in the pedal arm itself, we actually have two more sets of holes on either side of the center line, which is seven millimeters apart. So what that means is we can offset the pedal side to side, or the pedal pad, I should say, up to 22 millimeters per pedal. So if you did wanna have a wider gap between your brake and your throttle, you could adjust this one to the left and this one to the right, and that would give you a total offset of 44 millimeters different from what we have in the middle line here. So I think that's gonna be enough for most people. Just remembering again, because we don't have any lateral adjustment, we can't physically move the pedals from side to side. Now I did play around with that quite a bit 
on the uh, on the prototype pedals. I didn't find that it added any sort of detrimental effect having these offset. So I didn't find that the brake or the throttle was twisting or anything funny like that. I have found on a couple of other pedal sets that we've tested, if you do offset those pads, it can make the throttle start to bind a little bit in some cases. It hasn't been a problem at all with these ones though. So in terms of other adjustments relating to the throttle pedal, all we really have is just the preload on the spring and the ability to swap out to the uh, softer spring should we wish to do so as well. So all you need to do to adjust the preload is just release our locking nut here. And all that's basically doing is just creating a thread bind between the two so that it can't move around and adjust itself while you're driving. You'd be surprised how often that does actually happen on some other pedals that don't have some sort of a locking mechanism. One of the issues that was quite common on the original Husingville Ultimate pedals and something that we experienced personally was the clutch in particular would, uh, would slip over time. So having an extra locking nut like that is a smart thing. So we release that and then we simply just wind in or wind out our preload. You can see what that's doing is it's adding additional tension to the spring and that is just gonna adjust the amount of force that's required to get the spring moving. So simple as that. Now, if we wanna change that spring out completely, it's exactly the same process as what we had with releasing the clevis pin on our brake pedal just before. So we pop that out, pull the pin out. And again, this is completely toolless, which I really like. Slide that up pull it off and then we simply just change out our spring like so. Now, while we have this apart, one other really important point to note is you'll notice one of the mounting holes for the pedals themselves is actually sitting underneath this assembly here, which can make it a little bit tricky to get in with an Allen key. Now, thankfully, what they've done is they've lined that hole up with our sleeve here. So what we can do is we can actually put our Allen key through the sleeve and that lines up with that hole perfectly, which makes it nice and easy to mount these on your rig. So it only takes about an extra 10 seconds to just pop this off and uh, allows you to do what you need to do. So the little sleeve itself is made out of some sort of a plastic material. It might be Delrin or something like that, I think. It's definitely not metal, but that's gonna stop any sort of metal to metal contact sound as the pin is sliding through there as well. So you can hear it's just making a bit of a sliding sound, but it's not making any sort of metal to metal contact noise. So we'll pop that back in for now. Oop, rolling away. Slide our rod back in. Line that back up with our uh, Clevis here and you can see the little bearing system, little copper bearing that's sitting in there as well. So good to see that. Slot in our Clevis pin, back into position and we're good to go. Just make sure obviously that you've locked your uh, retaining screw down or your thumb nut down so nothing's gonna come loose. So all in all, a very simple design with the throttle, but it gets the job done. And look, to be honest with you, over the last two months that we've been using this same system, it's been really good. We haven't had any issues with it. It hasn't uh, squeaked or you know had to be adjusted or anything like that. It's I mean, the throttles are a pretty basic thing anyway, but the you know the stiffness, the stiffness and the feel of it's all very good. And uh, yeah, not nothing really to complain about or particularly uh, I guess rave about either. It's you know it's a pretty default kind of throttle, but it does what it needs to do and it does the job well. So let's move on to the brake now. And this is really what I think is the star of the show. So this is the Invicta Thorpe hydraulic cylinder. And basically what we're looking at here is a closed system which consists of a push rod here with a master cylinder and then a slave cylinder at the top which actually pulls in. So when we push down on the pedal, our push rod goes in on this side and what it does is it retracts a pin on the slave side here which pulls in and then our elastomer spring is actually sitting inside this little bell housing here. So really clever design for a couple of different reasons that I wanna run you through now. So with most hydraulic pedals that we see, what they're typically using is some sort of a master slave system where they're separated from each other. And those master and slave cylinders are typically real life race car parts. But the important thing to understand is that the slave cylinder that's being used is typically something that's operating the clutch on a real life car, not the brake. So even though it's a real life race car part, it's not actually intended for the, uh, for the usage case that it's actually being implemented on, on the pedals. So what they've done here is they've tried to simulate a real life race car feel as closely as they possibly can based on their experience with GT3 cars and a couple of other different types of cars which they race as well. And there's a couple of other videos that we've done where we've elaborated on that a little bit more. So I'll link some uh, other references down in the description below for you guys. But look, they make absolutely no excuses for the fact that these pedals or this brake pedal is extremely stiff. Now, I was a little bit skeptical of that going into this. Having used the prototype version of these pedals for over two months now, I've come to absolutely love that feeling. And if you go back and watch that first look video, we actually ended up being faster on one of our first attempts with this pedal than 
we had been on the Houston Bell Ultimate pedals that I'd been running for quite some time. Now, obviously you can set up the HE Ultimates to be stiffer than what we had them, but what I learned was that a stiffer pedal does actually seem to benefit you once you take the time to get used to it. And I believe the reason for that is the shorter the amount of throw, the more you're relying purely on the amount of pressure or force that you're exerting on the pedal and the less on position, the more you're able to fine tune in your muscle memory. But we'll elaborate on that more when we go for a drive a little bit later on as well. But completely enclosed system here, they're using mineral oil as well, so they're not using nasty carcinogenic uh, brake fluid. Now the reason they're able to do that is because we're not seeing the temperature cycles that we get in a real life race car. So real life brake fluid is designed to maintain its viscosity or its thickness uh, through a massive temperature range. Whereas with this, we're not seeing anywhere near that kind of temperature fluctuation. So we're able to get away with just using a basic mineral oil here. And what that means is that it's safe. It's not gonna poison anything. It's not gonna stain your carpet and cause those kinds of problems. So it's about choosing materials which are appropriate for the context of sim racing rather than just using off the shelf parts directly out of race cars, which is often overkill or just not necessary for sim racing. And that's one of the reasons why they're able to produce a quality set of pedals like these at a more reasonable price point than a lot of the other hydraulic pedals which we've tested over the years here at Boosted Media. So completely sealed design as well means that you've got far less chance of things like leakages. Not having a brake line between the master and the slave as well also removes the ability for that kind of spongy effect that we sometimes get in some hydraulic pedals. Now if we're using braided metal brake lines that's generally not a problem at all but if you're using rubber brake lines what can happen is those lines can expand and contract as you push down the pedal and that can give you a bit of a kind of spongy or rubber band like feel in the pedal. Take away a little bit of the detail that you get through the pedal. So not having any of those systems here means that you know, you've got a much more basic design, far less opportunity for failure here as well. But it is a completely closed system. It's not a user serviceable part and it's definitely not something that you should be pulling apart and uh, trying to make adjustments to yourself. Now they do also put these through millions of cycles as well. They've sent us a couple of videos, we'll overlay a few for you now, where they, uh, they basically built machines to test these pedals through millions and millions of cycles to ensure that they don't develop any leaks. And I can tell you in the real world as well, in the two and a half months that we've been running the prototype pedals, absolutely no issues with leakage whatsoever. And I do intend to run these pedals on my rig long term as well. So we'll obviously let you guys know if we do run into any difficulties there. So when we push down on the pedal, the push rod here compresses the hydraulic fluid. That then activates the slave cylinder here, which compresses inwards. And then we've got a pressure sensor sitting on the top here, which measures the amount of pressure. And that is what's relayed into the sim as you're braking pressure inside the game. And of course, an automotive grade harness to go along with that as well. And one of the things I have noticed here compared to the uh, the prototype is that they have actually heat shrunk over that as well and shortened the cable slightly just to tidy things up a little bit as well, which I'm happy to see. So what I wanna do now is quickly chuck the pedals up on top of a box. And there's a very good reason why we're gonna do that. So let's uh, let's explore that in a little bit more detail. So adjusting the preload or changing out the elastomer completely is very simple and straightforward. Again, you don't need any tools to do so. One thing I do want you to be aware of though, and the reason why I've put it up on this box is you can see the angle that this is sitting on means that if your pedal plate does extend beyond this, then you're not gonna be able to remove this assembly to change out your uh, elastomer. So let's just quickly show you exactly what I mean by that. You have to actually be able to screw this all the way off and you can imagine if it's sitting on a flat surface, you can't take that out. So you will have to pull the pedals off a rig if your pedal plate is extending beyond. But for the purpose of what we're doing here, we're just gonna sit it on top of this box so we can easily demonstrate this. So what we've done here is remove our little retainer thumb screw, and that allows us to then adjust the preload on the elastomer itself. So if we wind this out, you can see the medium or white elastomer sitting in the back there. And one of the things that we can do here is if we back off the preload just a little bit, so there's a tiny little bit of slack in there, what that allows us to do is have a little bit of squish in the pedal and it's not completely uh, its not completely loose, so it's not just slopping around. But what that allows us to do is simulate a little bit of initial uptake in the pedal to simulate the little bit of distance that the pad needs to travel before it interfaces with the rotor in a real car. So I actually found that I did really like to have just that little bit of, and I don't want to call it slop, but that little bit of uptake in the pedal just to kind of allow me to modulate around a little bit more accurately. But it was something that felt very realistic to me, having driven a couple of different races cars in the past and uh, something that I did really enjoy about the feeling of these pedals. So I would recommend, you know, experimenting around with this. By, uh, by default out of the factory, it's set to pretty much zero preload. So there's no tension on the elastoma, but it doesn't have any slack in it either. If you wind it off that little bit, you just get that little bit of uptake in the pedal. Now, importantly, again, because we do have that spring assembly in here, the pedal's not just flopping around loosely. And uh, you know, there's no, there's no slack in there whatsoever. It's just that little bit of, I guess, textured uptake 
in the pedal. So if we do want to change that elastomer out, all we need to do is just wind the preload collar off. The spring literally just pulls out like so, and then we can swap in our harder spring. Finger there just to hold it in place. Wind it on, a little bit of slack. Locking collar goes on, locking thumb screw I should say. Bind it up nice and tight and you are good to go. Simple as that. So it's literally a five second job to swap out that elastomer, provided that you don't need to pull the pedals off your rig to actually access it in the first place. But I'm gonna put that back on the medium just for now. So we'll quickly change it out again. Off, on. Whoops, there we go. Try not to cross thread it, because it is aluminium. There we go. Back it off just a touch. Thumb screw on and we are good to go. So not a massive range of adjustment available for the brake pedal. And I think that is probably one of the major limiting factors with these pedals. I think, you know, as I said before, they've designed them to simulate the feeling of a real life race car. And we will elaborate on that more when we go for a drive in just a minute. But, you know, they're not making any excuses for the fact that these are a really heavy pedal. And, you know, they don't have a huge range of adjustment available. So if you do like to have a really soft pedal with a large amount of travel, then these aren't the pedals for you. There are other pedals coming as well. I know they're working on some load cell pedals at the moment, which we're hoping to get our hands on to test very soon. So those will offer a larger range of adjustability, uh, you know, if you do like to have a longer stroke on your brake pedal. But if you are after a hard pedal like what this has, then, uh, you know, from our experience using the prototype, they have proven to be exceptionally good pedals to the point where I've, you know, continued to run them on my daily driver rig. So let's move on to our clutch pedal now, and you'll see this operates in a very similar manner to our throttle pedal. Same arm, same adjustments here. We've got the same uh, mechanism here for our Hall Effect sensor. What we do have though is this kind of cage assembly here, which gives us a two stage effect on our clutch. Now, there's a couple of different adjustments that we can do here. Obviously, we still have the same tilt adjustment. We still have the same 22 millimeter offset adjustment for our pedal pad two. So what we can do is we can adjust the maximum amount of throw with our little thumb screw down here. And that allows us to pretty much entirely dial out this two stage effect should we wish to do so. But first let's explain what exactly that is. So you can see as we push the pedal down, that entire assembly, and it's quite hard to push on the table, you'll see this better when we go for a drive a bit later on. But as we push that down, that whole assembly kind of flicks up and down. What that's doing is it's simulating the bite point or the friction point on the clutch in a real car. So in a real car, if you've driven a manual, and not so many people are doing that these days, but as you let the clutch out, there's a point where the, uh, where the flywheel actually interfaces with the clutch mechanism. And that's essentially creating the connection between the flywheel on the back of the engine and the drivetrain or gearbox. So they mesh together with that friction plate. And then as they bind together, the whole assembly starts to rotate in, uh, in unison. So what happens is as you let the clutch out, you kind of get this second stage. So once it bites, then it releases a lot more easily. And that's what this is simulating here. Now we do have a couple of different points of adjustment here. So you can see in the top, there's a couple of little R clips. So one on either side, that allows us to pop these little pins out and then we can adjust this assembly up and down. So the top setting where it is now is what's gonna give you the maximum effect of that two stage effect. As we drop that down, it's gonna become more and more and more linear. And we also have a preload adjustment here on the top exactly like what we had for the throttle. They don't include any other springs, but I found the tension on this spring is just about right. And with the, with the amount of adjustment that we have up and down here, you shouldn't have any problems dialing in something that feels relatively comfortable for you. Now, if you have it in the bottom setting, you pretty much don't feel that two stage effect at all. So a good solid amount of adjustment there, which I think is gonna suit you know, pretty much everybody. Now, if you wanna dial it out even further, what you can do is adjust your maximum travel here as well as your deflection. So you can see if I wind that out, I can actually adjust that to the point where the clutch is maxing out before it's even reached that two stage effect. So if you wanna dial that out entirely, that would be how you do that. And then if you wanna make it a little bit more, then what you can do is wind this in. So we'll just release our thumb screw wind it in and then locking nut goes down. And now when we push the pedal down, you can see it goes a lot further and that's got a much more 
I mean, you can really see how that's kind of clunking across now. So there is actually a surprisingly large amount of adjustment available here on the clutch, but otherwise everything operates exactly the same as it did with the throttle pedal. And as mentioned before, this is utilizing the same Hall effect sensor for inputting the uh, clutch position to the sim as what we had with the throttle pedal. So uh, yeah, that is pretty much everything we need to cover in terms of the clutch. You can see the little RGB or addressable RGB strip along the front there, I should say. So let's get these mounted together now. We'll quickly run you through that and then we can get it up and running on the rig and uh, yeah, put it through some driving tests. Now, one interesting observation here, when we did the first look of the prototype pedals, they said to us that they were intending to have some sort of a floating pin assembly here so that when you join the two uh, modules together, so the clutch to the throttle and brake, you wouldn't have to attach any plugs or anything like that. Now, that doesn't appear to actually have ended up uh, happening, but it is still a pretty simple process to put this together. So what I wanted to do is run you through that now. So you can see on the side of these pedals, there's some little holes, one on either side here and here and here and here, and there's some little grub screws sitting in the top of our brake and uh, throttle. And then there's some little threads here where the grub screws, which they included in the package for the clutch, would go in. So then we also have these little pins, which are gonna slot in on either side, like so. And what I'm gonna do is just loosen off those grub screws just to make absolutely sure that those pins are pushed in all the way. I think they are. I don't think they're locked down from factory, we actually just pull that out entirely. Yeah, I can see that pin is in place there. So we're gonna pop that in. And then just lock the grub screw down. There we go. And same deal with this one. I'm just gonna orient it so the little hole in the pin is pointing upwards. You can see these grub screws. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on camera, but they do have a slightly convex surface on there. So I'm just going to try and line that up with a little hole on the pin just to make sure that it's locked in as tightly as it can be. So we'll tighten that down nice and tight. And you can see now those pins aren't going to move. And then before you slide the two sides together, there is one more thing you need to do. So there's a little rubber plug just here. We're going to pop that out. So it just pulls out like so. And that frees up the little channel here. Now we can pop the two sides together. So it slots in like so. And we're gonna install our little grub screws in the top. So nice and secure. And again, once these pedals are bolted onto your rig, you don't, you're not actually relying on these to you know, stop them from moving around. So it's not like they really need to be able to you know, withstand a lot of force or anything like that. It's just basically to hold them in place until you're bolted down on the rig. So second one is a little bit more tricky to get to with the um, with the clutch arm there. So not something that you're gonna to wanna to try and do on your rig. Definitely something you wanna do on the table before you've got it mounted down. So we'll get that bolted on. There we go, that's nice and secure. So then what we need to do is just flip it over. Just be really careful when you do flip it over, you're not resting it on the electronics here. So what we're gonna do is actually sit it up that way. A little bit awkward there, rather than uh, sitting it the other way up and resting on the sensor. So by default, the little fly lead here is tucked away and secured with this little metal cable clip. So we're just gonna bend this out like so, pop our cable out, just bend that back down so it's out of the way again. Now that will fatigue over time as well. So you wanna be really careful if you are planning on you know, taking this off again, you're only gonna get a couple of cycles before these little legs snap off, not a big deal but just something to be aware of. Then all we need to do is just run this through the channel. And then what we're gonna do is plug this little plug into the socket on our clutch. Now you can see it does look like a square, but the assembly there is slightly offset. So we wanna make sure our little lever or our little push button is at the top or the bottom, I suppose you could call it, but the top as we're looking at it. And then we're just gonna slot that in there, plug it in like so. If you need to release it again, you just push on the button and it pops out nice and easily. So it's a decent quality connection. So we'll just pop that in again, like so, and then tuck our wiring away. Simple as that, set and forget, you're never gonna have to look at it again. So lastly, before we get this mounted on the rig, just wanna quickly run over the electronics here as well. So I'm gonna pop the cover off 
so we can have a quick look. Now, if I recall correctly, the prototype that we had, the little PCB, which is a custom designed PCB, had uh, Rev2 written on it. So it'd be interesting to see whether we're still running a revision two board here or whether they've uh, made any changes there as well since the last one. I think they have because they did warn me not to try and flash the firmware on the previous one. So let's have a look here. Okay, Rev4 now. So there've actually been a couple of different revisions since. So we can see the opposing side of that connection to our clutch. That's our connection to our brake and our throttle. And we've got a little processor there, a little clock chip it looks like, our USB-C connection, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And we can see stamped on there as well, Acer Tech, uh, the branding. So this is a custom PCB which they've developed and had printed for their own purposes, not an off-the-shelf Leo Bodner or similar. Now, I wanted to quickly mention this plastic cover as well. This is something that has changed since the prototype. The prototype was just a 3D printed piece of plastic. Something that I am a little bit disappointed about just as we put this back together is um, I did sort of, I, I, I kind of felt like the little cable clamp thing on the top here or cable retainer was a little bit kind of prototype spec. So I let it slide on the, on the prototype, but looking at it in the context of a final product, the reason why I'm not a big fan of this, and I know, like I understand what they're trying to do, and I agree with the principle of what they're trying to do, but I don't think the implementation is quite as good as it could be. So what they've done here is they've got the USB-C connection pointing forwards towards you. And the idea is that they don't wanna have a plug floating out the back here that you might step on or bump and tear off. So the idea is that you plug this in on the front like this, and that plugs in and then you loop it over through the little plastic clip and it is quite difficult to plug in there. So it is you know, a pretty solid little clip there. So it is quite, I'm gonna to have to loosen the plastic even just to get it clicked in there in the first place. And I mean, you can see if you, if you get this wrong, it's gonna snap very, very easily. So I'm just gonna be careful. There we go, that's clicked in now. So what this is doing is you can see that cable still just slides around inside that clip. So the idea was that if you step on the cable, the load is going on this assembly here rather than just pulling on the plug. In practice, however, I think it actually does the opposite of what it's intended to do because you can imagine if you step on that cable, it's just gonna pull through that loop, potentially snap those little legs off this. And then what's gonna happen is instead of the plug being pulled straight out from the back and potentially just coming unplugged without any damage, what's gonna happen is it's gonna pull and it's actually gonna tear the plug upwards rather than straight out. And that will absolutely 100% snap, uh, snap the connector off the board and you'll be up for a replacement board. So yeah, I, I get what they're trying to do. And I do like the idea of having the plug facing forward so that you're not likely to step on it or snag on it or anything. But I just feel like this could be implemented better. What I'll probably end up doing is actually sticking a little cable securer to the base plate here, or maybe even just running a cable tie through these two holes or something just to secure that cable. Because with the amount of stuff that we're moving around here in the studio, there is every risk that I'll at some point lean on this cable and uh, end up tearing that off the board. But look, honestly, that's really, I mean, just beyond kind of, you know, nitpicking little design elements and, you know, subjective things like whether or not you like the base plate design, whether you like the lines, whether you, you know, whether the lack of symmetry here bothers you, you know, little things like that, which are purely subjective. That's really the only thing in the design that I kind of look at and I go, you know, that just doesn't seem like they put a lot of effort into it. Everything else is really, really great. So let's get them up and running now on the rig. We'll uh, have a look at the software side of things, see how that's changed since the prototype and then do some driving tests. Okay, so we swapped out the prototype pedals for the full retail version now, and everything feels pretty much exactly the same as it did. In fact, you know, I can't really tell any difference, to be honest with you, between the prototypes and the full retail version, which I did expect. The only significant difference there being just that, uh, that little rubber pad that we uh, talked about earlier on the return. So when we release our throttle pedal now, pretty much completely silent clutch, completely silent too. The brake never really made any noise anyway because you know it's a, it's a pretty soft uh, return back to zero. So for those who were concerned about noise, you do still have a bit of a clunk there when you push your pedals to 100%, your clutch and your throttle at least. Um, 
What I find when I'm driving is that I don't tend to sort of slam it into that bump stop anyway. It's usually a kind of soft movement. So you may find you get a little bit of a tapping noise when you reach 100% depending on your driving style, but I don't think it's loud enough that it's gonna bother anybody, even if you're sort of, you know, playing next to, you know, a bedroom or somebody trying to watch TV or something like that, or in an apartment upstairs. I don't think that this is gonna be the noisiest thing on your rig anymore, which was the concern that I had with the prototypes. So yeah, happy with all that. And it hasn't added any sort of, you know, weird feeling to the pedals, it hasn't made them feel less mechanical or less, uh, you know, lifelike either. So I think that solution is good, even though it's a very simple solution, it seems to have done the job quite well. Other than that, everything feels exactly the same. What I did was actually put the pedals side by side on the table before I installed them and just, you know, made sure I had all the adjustments exactly the same, just so I could compare directly and sort of feel if there was anything weird going on with any binding or smoothness issues or just anything that felt different basically. And there's absolutely nothing. But what I'll do now is run you through my observations on each of the pedals. Then we'll jump in, have a look at the software and do some driving. So let's start off with the throttle pedal, the simplest of the three. So very smooth action throughout the stroke. Doesn't feel like it's increasing in pressure or anything like that. The uh, spring rate is very linear here, which is exactly what I like. Uh, I didn't end up having to add any preload here either. The hardest spring of the two, which they include, which is the default pre-installed spring, has a good amount of tension there. So I, I really can't imagine anybody wanting to swap out to that weaker spring, but you know, if you did want to, you do have the option there. But nice and smooth, there's no noise, there's no binding. It's very, very smooth throughout. Now, one thing that I mentioned in the previous video we did on the prototype pedals was that I was a little bit concerned that these pedal pads uh, might have a little bit too much grip on them for some people. I mentioned that one of the things I do with the throttle is kind of slide it underneath my foot, and then I found that it was kind of gripping the bottom of my boot a little bit. Now, you can see here now, that's actually sliding perfectly fine under my foot. I have probably adapted my driving style a little bit just throughout the last two and a half months that I've been using the prototype pedals. But what I found is that the sole of my boots here did uh, sort of, I guess, become a little bit more slippery over time. So it might've just been that, you know, they'd never really been used in that manner before, even though they're a couple of years old. And, you know, over time, they've just gotten a little bit more slippery. So yeah, it may be driving style. It may be that the boots have loosened up a little bit, but either way, it's not turned out to be an issue at all. Now, just while we're on the subject of pedal pads as well, uh, I did do quite a bit of driving over the last couple of months with uh, socks as well as bare feet, just to sort of test it out. One of the concerns that I had about these pedal pads, remembering they do have the option option for smoother pedal pads uh, as you, you can buy them as an optional accessory if you wish to do so. But yeah, look, I, um, I didn't find that it was uncomfortable to drive with socks or bare feet for sort of half an hour to maybe an hour. Perfectly comfortable, didn't have any issues at all with you know blisters forming or anything like that. What I did find though is that it did tend to wear through the socks that I was wearing. So I would recommend going with those smoother pads if you do intend to drive with socks or bare feet. You'll probably find that it will do a really good job of exfoliating your feet and leaving dead skin all over the pedals as well, which is kind of gross. So yeah, I, um, yeah, I would definitely recommend going with the smoother pads if you're gonna be using socks or bare feet. But you, you can get away with, you know, short stints with bare feet or socks with these pedal pads, should you wish to do so as well. Another thing, just quickly on the pedal pads too, I haven't felt the need to offset them at all. The uh, spacing that I have here is absolutely fine. Heel and toe works fine like this as well. I haven't really got the pedal set up for heel and toe because it's not really a type of driving that I do very often. What I would probably do if I was setting this up for heel and toe is move my throttle pedal forward just a little bit or move my brake pedal back just a little bit, simply because the travel is so restricted on these pedals that you know you kind of you don't have quite the reach that you do with others so you don't need to have quite such a big offset if that makes sense so you can imagine when you push the pedal down when you push the brake down you kind of want to roll across and you want to have the throttle sitting just a little bit forward from uh, where the position of the brake is under full braking pressure, which it's not quite at the moment. But the way I've got this set up now is pretty much ideal for left foot braking. But look, in terms of the throttle, there's really not a whole lot uh, left to talk about there. It's nice and smooth, there's no binding, there's no funny noises, there's no squeaking, and we didn't have any problems with squeaking over the time that we were using it either, so that's all good. So let's jump across to the clutch now. Obviously that operates pretty much exactly the same way as the throttle does, with the exception of that lever system to give us that two-stage clutch effect. Now, the way I've got this set up here is I've got slightly shorter throw than a lot of people might wanna have. And what that's done is it's dialed out quite a lot of that two-stage effect. I'm personally not a big fan of it. I find it often makes it a little bit more difficult for me to launch a car. So yeah, I've set it up that way intentionally. You can of course weaken the effect as well by dropping the mechanism down as we discussed earlier. But I feel where it is now, I've kind of got a bit of a step there where I can feel the friction point or the bite point for the clutch. But you know, beyond that, 
it's a nice smooth linear action. And what that allows me to do is let the clutch out nice and smoothly without sort of feeling like it's trying to fight me to push me back to zero. I've, I just find that it's a lot easier for me to launch a car that way. But you know, the way you set this up is gonna be pretty subjective. And I do feel like there's enough scope of adjustment there that it's gonna suit the majority of people. So no issues there at all. And there's really not a whole lot more to say about the clutch silent operation as well, other than just if you do clunk it in to the bump stop on 100%, but returning to zero is completely silent now, which is great. And yeah, nice and smooth, no squeaking, no grinding, no nothing, no issues to speak of whatsoever. And again, the spacing is not a problem at all. I've got plenty of room to move across between the uh, brake and the clutch. And just for reference, these are size 11 UK boots for those who might be wondering. So over to the brake now, I'm running the medium spring, which is the default setting here. I did run the soft spring for quite some time in the prototypes before switching to the medium. And I did find that, you know, that, that shorter travel did end up benefiting my lap times and my consistency, which does sound kind of counterintuitive. You'd think that the less movement you have, the less control you have. But in reality, that's just not the case because you're modulating your brake pressure around purely the amount of force or the amount of pressure that you're exerting on the pedal and not the uh, position of your foot at all. So when you're using a lot of load cell paddles that do have quite a long stroke, what ends up happening is your muscle memory is kind of set in a kind of, I guess, hybrid way. So you're kind of using a combination of the position as well as the amount of pressure. Whereas with these pedals, you're purely relying on the amount of force or the amount of pressure that you're exerting on the pedal. Now, one of the really interesting things that I like about the design of these pedals, and we talked about this in the prototype video as well, what's happening here is when I push the pedal down, you can see that slave cylinder is pulling in. You can see the little uh, orange part at the back there moving in and out, that retainer. And what's happening is that elastomer is squishing up inside that bell housing, but the bell housing stops it from being able to deform beyond its maximum tolerance. So a lot of uh, load cell and hydraulic pedals that we've tested here on the channel have had issues with those elastomers blowing out, uh, particularly the BJ sim racing pedals that we tested. We quite liked the feeling of those, but we did find that those elastomers were failing quite frequently. We have tested some other pedals here as well, which have taken steps to mitigate that issue. Uh, the Mecha Cup 1 pedals, for example, had the little metal cups that sat over the elastomers, which would, again, basically work the same way as this, restrict the amount of deflection that you had or the amount of uh, you know movement that you had inside the elastomer so it couldn't ever be deformed beyond its maximum tolerance. So what this is doing here is it's not only protecting the elastomer from blowing out, but it's also giving us a nice consistent feel because it's stopping it from you know moving too much. And one of the things that does happen with elastomers over time is if you're consistently deforming them beyond their maximum tolerance, they do tend to soften up and they do change their feeling over time. And again, obviously, if we're trying to set muscle memory, the last thing we wanna have is any sort of variation like that. So one of the observations that I have for the brake pedal is that it has been probably the most consistent brake pedal that I've ever used. Again, two and a half months of use on the prototypes and I never had to change anything. Everything always felt exactly the same every time I jumped into the sim. So that is all good. Now, another thing that I noticed with these pedals, which I really like, is that you do get the benefit of that hydraulic feeling. Now, what I mean by that is that there's, it's, and it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but you can feel a little bit of texture in the pedal. It doesn't feel like it's sort of binding or metal to metal contact or anything like that, but you do get that little bit of texture there. You feel like you're pushing up against something mechanical. And that's one of the, not complaints, but that's one of the observations that I have comparing this to something like Husingvel Ultimate pedals, for example. Absolutely love the Husingvel Ultimates. I think they're absolutely fantastic. And I ran them on this rig for quite some time before switching to these pedals. But Whenever you're pushing up against you know, an elastomer or a piece of rubber or something like that, you don't get a whole lot of texture in the pedal. So it just, it, you know, it does feel like you're pushing up against a block of rubber because that's essentially what you're doing. Now, in terms of setting things like muscle memory and driving quickly, that's not a problem, obviously. And I don't think that you're going to be any faster because of the texture that you're feeling here. But it does just kind of give it that added level of authenticity. It feels like it's connected to something mechanical. And that is something that I do really appreciate about these pedals. Now, another thing that you'll notice here as well is that I do have that little bit of uptake in the pedal adjusted in there as well. So I've backed off the uh, retainer on the back of the elastomer just that little bit, just to give me that simulated feeling of the uptake between the pad and the rotor on a real car. Now it might sound a little bit weird, and again, this is gonna be a very subjective thing, but what I've found is that kind of, you know, keeping my foot off the brake and then just hovering it on as I'm approaching the braking zone, feeling that little bit of uptake, you know, it, it kind of gives me confidence in the braking ability of the car. And it's it's just like driving in real life. When, you, when you're driving into a situation, maybe you're coming through some traffic lights and you're not sure whether a car that's approaching is actually gonna stop. You tend to hover your foot over the brake, you're kind of ready to do something. And you kind of, you know, you feel 
the bite point of the brakes on the car and you kind of feel where it's ready to go so that you're almost like you're primed and ready to hit the brakes. So that's kind of what we've been able to achieve with this as well. And yeah, I just, I mean, again, it is a purely subjective thing, but it's something that I really do like about these pedals. It really does have a genuine real life kind of feeling to it. And yeah, it just feels really, really good. Now, again, another important point to note here is just the reliability when it comes to that hydraulic cylinder as well. Pretty much every single set of hydraulic pedals that we've tested here on the channel, with the exception of the HPP pedals that we tested recently, and Tom actually ran them on his rig for a good couple of months just to make absolutely sure there weren't any issues. But every single set of pedals that we've tested, with the exception of these and the HPP pedals, have had some form of leak or weeping from the either master cylinder or the slave cylinder. These have had absolutely no issues whatsoever. So really happy to report that as well. And I think that's everything we need to cover in terms of initial observations. Happy with the heel rest as well. I haven't found that to be uncomfortable. There's enough room there to accommodate my larger feet. So I think if you've got smaller feet, you're not gonna have any problems there. And although we do have that little divot between the clutch and the brake, I've never found that my heel has kind of got stuck in there or anything like that. It's never been a problem in terms of comfort. And uh, yeah, happy. So let's jump into the software. Okay, software. So what we're looking at here is version 1.0.0.0 of RaceHub. Now RaceHub is gonna be responsible for managing all the various different peripherals which uh, Acertec will be releasing in the future. So wheelbases, wheels, pedals, uh, you know, motion platforms, anything that they release will all be controlled through this one piece of software, RaceHub. So obviously then very important that this is clean, well presented and easy to use, which I'm happy to say it is. Now, for those of you who have watched the prototype video, software that we're looking at today is extremely similar. There's not really a whole lot different here at all. So what we're gonna do is run you through the software again here now for those who haven't seen that video, as well as take you through the calibration process and everything. So if you've already watched the previous video, you can probably just skip straight to the driving test to be honest with you. But for those who are interested, let's push forward. So we've got a button here for pedals and underneath pedals we've got in the pit and in the pit which basically means there's going to be some stuff here which we don't want to reveal yet <laughs> that's what that means but let's click on pedals and you can see you get this nice animation here which uh, doesn't have any delay or lag which is really nice so push the pedals in and out and we can kind of see what's going on with them I mean it's it's not really functional but it's cool I like it <laughs> so we've got showroom that's that one we've got calibration which we'll look at in just a moment. We've got pedal maps. We've got LED adjustment here too. Let's have a quick look at LED adjustment. Now, one of the changes between the prototype and the full retail version is we now have uh, ARGB or addressable RGB LEDs. So unfortunately at this point in time, the software doesn't give us any addressable functionality here. So as we spin the color wheel, you can see the colors changing on the pedals. I can go white, I can go any color in between, and I can also dim the lights or switch the lights off as well, should I wish to do so. To be honest with you, I've been running them with the lights off, but I'm gonna leave them on a kind of orangey red for now, just to match the theme of the pedals. And uh, that's that. So I'm assuming at some point in the future, they'll add functionality for addressable. And what that means is that each individual LED along the strip can uh, you know, be controlled individually. And that opens up the opportunity for a couple of other interesting things as well. Like you could potentially have flag colors flashing on the pedals. Uh, you could have some sort of an ABS warning or maybe, you know, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that you could do really. The, you know, the sky's the limit there in terms of what you can do, what you can imagine. So I don't know whether they're gonna have some sort of API uh, built into the software that allows the SIM titles or maybe something like SIM Hub to talk to the RGB LEDs. Uh, that is all just speculation at this point, but we'll see what happens in the future there. So we're gonna skip over pedal maps just for now and go to calibration. Let's run through this. So a very nice graphical user interface here. We've got adjustments for our high dead zone and low dead zone, as well as a calibration. So let's just quickly run through the calibration process for the throttle. We hit calibrate press and release the throttle. So we're gonna push the throttle all the way to the maximum, but not pushing down too hard on it because we don't wanna have to push past the maximum just to get to that 100% throttle point. We wanna make sure we're always getting 100% throttle in the game. Now that's uh, kind of playing to the reason why they didn't wanna add a uh, rubber bump stop on the maximum threshold for the throttle because they don't want you to have, sort of have to hit the bump stop and then push harder to get 100% throttle inside the game. So we've pushed to 100% there. We've got that nice metal to metal mechanical bump stop there so there's no ambiguity but we don't wanna to push too hard just in case. And then we're gonna release it all the way back again and hit complete. So we can see now when we push the pedal to 100%, we get 100%. If we take the throttle back to zero, we get zero. But if I rest my foot on it even just a little bit, 
we are actually getting a little bit of reading there. So that is where our dead zone comes into play. So if we have a habit of resting our foot on the throttle a little bit like I sometimes do, then what we can do is we can add a little bit of dead zone there. And then what that means is that we have to push the pedal past that point before we start getting a reading inside our game. So this is kind of like our raw reading here, the bar as it goes up and down. And then once we get within the bounds of our dead zone, the percentage is the value that will actually be passed through into the sim. So we can see there, I have to push the pedal down 17% or so before I actually start to get a reading. Now, because these pedals do have such a nice solid return to zero and there's no slop or play in any of the pedals, what that means is that you don't really need a whole lot of dead zone in the throttle. I'd probably only add maybe just 2% there just to make absolutely sure that resting my foot on the pedal and having that bad habit isn't gonna be detrimental to my driving. But other than that, absolutely fine. And you can see there, the throttle is reaching 100% at 100%. You might wanna add a little bit of dead zone there just in case, just to make absolutely sure that you're never gonna get into a scenario where you know, you're pushing the pedal all the way down but not quite getting 100% inside the game. But again, because we do have that metal to metal mechanical bump stop there with no squishiness to it, we don't really need to worry too much about dead zone in our throttle. And because we're running uh, Hall effect sensors here as well, we shouldn't see any variation in this over time. Clutch pretty much exactly the same as well in terms of how that's calibrated. So we go hit calibrate, push all the way to the maximum, release to the minimum, hit complete, and then we can set our dead zones up around there as well. Now, one thing that you may want to do is kind of calibrate and adjust this around the bite point in the specific car that you're driving as well. So for example, if you have a car that has a bite point that's really high up in the range, you might want to calibrate it a little bit higher. If the bite point is lower down, you might want to calibrate it lower down just to make sure that the bite point inside the game is matching the mechanical feel of the bite point on the pedal itself. But again, it's gonna be a very subjective thing. The important thing here is that you do have the ability to adjust that around. Now, the way we calibrate the brake in terms of software is pretty much the same, although the approach to actually doing it mechanically is a little bit different. So we're gonna hit calibrate here. And what we're gonna do, you can see we've got a different prompt here this time. So it says press and release the brake. The brake will never be at zero bar due to the internal pressure of the cylinder. It will not affect the calibration or gameplay. So what we're gonna do is push our pedal down to the maximum amount of pressure that we would ever wanna have under 100% braking pressure inside the game. So we're not trying to max out the cylinder here. We're not just gonna go balls to the wall and slam it as hard as we possibly can. It's about putting in the maximum amount of pressure that you would ever wanna have to get to 100% inside the game. Remembering that most of the time, you're not wanting to brake in the real world beyond about 80% braking pressure, obviously depending on the type of car that you're driving, whether you have ABS and so forth. So what I like to do is push to about the amount of pressure that I would wanna have for, you know, sort of 80% braking pressure inside the game, and then push a little bit harder than that, and that is gonna be my maximum amount of braking pressure. So I'm just gonna cancel that and go back in again because I was kind of mucking around there demonstrating stuff. So we're gonna hit calibrate, gonna push to my 80% mark, which is about there, and then a little bit harder, and you can see that's giving me about 37, 38 bar, and then we're gonna release it back to zero and hit complete. So what that's allowing me to do now is push my pedal down to about 80% pressure. And you can see there that actually pretty much did jump exactly to 80% pressure. And then we can modulate around that with just the subtlest little movement of our foot. And you can see in the footage there, I'm barely even moving my ankle or moving my foot at all. It's purely just down to the pressure that I'm applying to the pedal from my thigh. And that is the best way to establish muscle memory. We don't want to establish muscle memory for braking around the movement of our ankle. We want to establish it around the pressure from our thigh. That is the correct way to set up a brake pedal. And the interesting thing here is that you can see just how much ability I have to modulate my braking pressure and how smooth that is despite the very slight movement of the pedal. So it just goes to show how much control you have, even though it might not look like you do just based off what you're seeing in the footage. So. Thought that was interesting. And again, we have the ability to adjust our high dead zone and our low dead zone should we wish to do so. But in my case here, I'm happy with that calibration and I don't need to do anything. So that is how we calibrate the pedals. Now, one really important thing to note here is that this calibration is actually flashed to an EEPROM on the pedals themselves. And that's really important because what it means is that if you need to change something else on the rig or you, you know, move the pedals over to a different rig, the calibration is gonna remain exactly the same. It also means that in sim racing titles that require their own calibration, all you need to do is just push to maximum and minimum, and that is literally it. And we'll show you that when we jump into iRacing in just a moment. But iRacing in particular, because that has its own 
own calibration. What you'll often find is that if you change a wheel or you change something else on the rig, or it just loses its calibration for some reason, you then have to go back in and recalibrate your pedals. Now you can just go in and adjust the uh, INI file to put in exactly the same values if you're really sensitive to it. But what it means is if you're calibrating on the fly, every time you calibrate the pedals, it's gonna be that little bit different and it can ruin your muscle memory. So having it done this way is a really, really great feature. And it's something that we loved about the Husingville Ultimate Plus pedals with the Smart Control software as well. Definitely don't wanna understate this because I do really love this way of doing it. It's so much better than you know programs like DI View, for example. It really does make a very big difference. So let's jump across to the Pedal Map tab now. And this allows us to set up a non-linear curve for each of our pedals. So we'll quickly run you through that as well. We'll enable it. And you can see here at the moment, we've got a linear sweep for our throttle. So our X axis along the bottom here is the mechanical position or the raw input. And then the Y axis up and down is the value as it goes through into the SIM. So that's what the, that's what the game will actually see. So we've got a couple of presets here. We've got an exponential curve like this. And then we've got a bell curve like this. So say for example, you're driving a really high powered car like the new Mercedes in iRacing, for example, something that doesn't have traction control and has a lot of power to the rear wheels. You might wanna set a curve something like this. And what that allows you to do is be a little bit more gentle with how you apply your throttle coming out of a corner. And it's not until you really get up in it that it really applies 100% power there. So you can see, even though my input is linear down here, my raw value along the bottom, the value as it comes through into the sim is very different. So for 40% input, we're only getting 20% output and so forth. Now we can customize these as well. We can drag them around to our heart's content at each of the nodes here. And that allows us to set it up to be exactly how we want. Or we can go with a preset of a bell curve like this. And this is something that you might use for say a low powered car, like an MX-5, for example, in iRacing. So something that you wanna be able to get on the power as quickly as possible out of the turn. You don't wanna have that little delay in pushing the pedal down cost you a couple of thousands out of a turn. And it's probably not gonna make a whole lot of difference over the course of a lap, but you know, it is what it is. And that is something that some people might find useful. To be honest with you guys, I don't tend to use non-linear pedal curves. I just find that, you know, I could, I just adapt my driving to, you know, suit whatever car I'm driving, but some people absolutely swear by it and love it. So it's great that the option's there. So I'm gonna set that back to linear for now. Same idea here with the clutch as well. Remember we talked before about adjusting so that the bite point inside the sim is exactly the same as the mechanical bite point on the pedal. And this is the way that you can achieve that. So say for example, you've got a curve like this. What that means is around the bite point, I've got a small scope of movement there. And then as I go from the bite point down, then it rolls off very quickly and I get underway. So again, you can fine tune this to be however you want. So if I was gonna go with non-linear, I would definitely go with a bell curve here. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to have less movement inside the actual sim for more movement on the pedal. So it means that the sweet spot is effectively larger when it comes to the bite point inside the sim, because you can see the difference between 40% raw input and 80% raw input on the pedal is only about 15% difference inside the sim. And we could make that even more profound as well. So say we know the bite point for the clutch inside the game is say 70%. What we could do is we could set our curve like this. And then we've got a range of 40% to 80% on our pedal physically. And that's only actually influencing about 5% inside the sim. So it means anywhere within that range, we're not gonna have the car sort of slipping and jumping and moving around. So very useful in that regard for those who do drive a lot of manual cars that require clutch launches. For me, again, I can tend to just kind of adjust my driving style with the linear pedal, but you know, it is what it is. And I really do like the fact that this is here. Now with the brake, again, I like to just have a linear response curve here. I don't like to make any adjustments, but I think really where the value of a non-linear brake adjustment is, is very similar to what we just discussed with the clutch. So say we have a bell curve like this, what it allows us to do is say our threshold point is around that sort of 80% mark. What it allows us to have is a wider range to operate or a wider range of pressures to operate within that efficiency range for our braking. So what it means is that the, you know, the subtlest little change in the amount of pressure that we're exerting on the pedal isn't gonna suddenly make you lock up or you, know, you, get, you get more range to modulate around that input there. So you can see again, 40%, to 80% physical input on the pedal is only giving us a change at the moment as I've got it set up 
of you know maybe like three or four percent so again it's going to depend on the car you're driving whether or not you have abs i can't really think of any scenario where you want to have an exponential curve for brakes that just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me but i can definitely see why some people might want to use a bell curve for their brake but for me i just like to keep it linear and adjust my driving style around what i'm doing so I mentioned before the relationship between the calibration being flashed to the pedals and eye racing. So I just want to quickly show you exactly what I mean by that. So we jump in here and hit on pedal calibration. All we need to do is just push each pedal to 100, release it back to zero, and that is literally it. Brake, just push it as hard as we can, back to zero, clutch, 100% back to zero, and that is it. And the reason it works that way, just to be 100% clear, is because the signal that's actually coming out of the pedals and being interpreted by Windows and by the SIM is actually got that calibration already applied to it, rather than it being applied in real time over the top as an extra layer, so to speak. So that's the reason why you don't need to do a separate calibration inside iRacing. But anyway, let's jump in now and do some driving. Okay, so what I would normally do at this point in the video is take you for some laps in the Porsche 911 Cup car around Imola. That's normally what I do for my initial impressions section of a pedal review video, and there's a couple of reasons I do that, but I wanna do something a little bit different today simply because we've already done exactly that with the prototype pedals, and because these pedals feel exactly the same to use, I didn't see any benefit in basically just repeating myself and doing the exact same thing again. So what I wanted to do instead is spend a bit of time just kind of taking you through the experience of using these pedals over the last couple of months, and some of the things that I've learned and how I've adapted my driving style and become a lot faster and a lot more consistent than I was previously. So the most important thing I want you to understand here is that because these pedals are, because this brake pedal is so stiff and because there's not a huge amount of adjustment available there like some other pedals, it has kind of forced me to adapt myself to driving with a stiffer brake pedal. And what that's done is greatly improved my consistency and my overall speed. Now the thing I want to make sure is clear there is that doesn't necessarily mean that you know the faster the faster pace and the more consistency is purely down to these pedals being better because I could go back and set up other pedals that I've run previously on the rig to you know operate in the same way or you know have a stiffer brake pedal there as well. If I was to go back for example and put my Husingvel Ultimate pedals back on the rig again now I would set them up to be a lot stiffer than, um, than what I had them when I was running them on the rig. So the important thing to understand there is that it's not down to these pedals being fundamentally better, but just down to that philosophy of having a stiffer brake pedal and the benefits that come with that. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more now about the experience of actually running these pedals and what it's taught me. So. What I've found and what we kind of alluded to before is that the stiffer brake pedal, because you're not relying on movement of your ankle for your braking modulation, you're able to modulate your braking so much more accurately than if you've got a long stroke. So you'll see in the telemetry, my inputs are pretty smooth. Now I'm not, I haven't been driving this car a lot recently. So I'm kind of a little bit all over the place. I'm gonna pick up my pace as I go here. But you'll see that my inputs are quite smooth. I'm not kind of just jumping all over the place. Like is the case if I'm using a softer brake pedal. So the benefit of that has been far more consistency. I've also found the throttle pedals nice and smooth. Haven't had any issues driving with the clutch either, but admittedly I don't use a clutch all that often anyway. So. There's not a whole lot that I can really sort of, I guess, add on top of what we've discussed previously there. But see, hitting Apex is nice and cleanly, modulating my throttle input there too. Get the power down. Nice and smooth. Bit of a twitch there. But I guess in terms of the mechanical design, the thing that I'm loving the most is just that slight little bit of hydraulic texture that you get in the brake pedal. It just gives you that confidence. And having that little bit of uptake there as well 
it just communicates so well what's going on with the car. And I've, I, I've just found confidence that I never had before. There was elements to braking that I just, I never really felt like I really felt what the car was doing. And it was kind of just, you know, you'd, you'd slam the brake pedal down and then you'd kind of just sort of be guessing what was gonna happen from there. And that, that really did have a very strong detrimental impact on my, uh, on my consistency. But what I'm gonna do now is just try to put in a quicker lap where I'm not talking. Just let you guys watch, let you guys see the telemetry. And just see for yourselves all the various different elements that we've discussed all coming into play together. So there we go, it wasn't the fastest lap in the world, but it was a very smooth, very clean, hit all my apexes, didn't have any dramas. And again, this is the first time I've driven this car on this track for quite some time now, so I wasn't expecting the world's fastest lap time. But I think that gives you a good indication of the kind of inputs that I'm making, the smoothness, the modulation, all those little things that are important to driving quickly and consistently. So let's move on now into our conclusions. Okay, so conclusions on the Acetec Sim Sports Invicta hydraulic pedals. Now, we had a 15 minute discussion off the back of our experience with the uh, prototype pedals, which I really highly recommend you check out. We went through a bunch of detail and comparisons with a lot of different pedals that are on the market, and Tom and I both shared our thoughts. Now, I don't wanna sort of go through all exactly the same stuff again, so I'll put a link down in the description with a timestamp to exactly that part of the video. Definitely recommend watching that. But to quickly summarize again for you guys, the experience with the full production version of these pedals is exactly the same in terms of the driving experience as what it was with the prototypes, with the exception, of course, of the additional rubber bump stops that we have now in our return part of the stroke when the pedal comes back to zero, which does significantly reduce the operating noise of these pedals in general. Haven't had any issues with squeaking or groaning or creaking. It was just that metal to metal contact that we had on the prototype pedals, which was a little bit noisy and would maybe be something that you'd have to consider if you were right next to a bedroom or maybe in an apartment had people underneath you, something like that. On these pedals, it's been absolutely no issue whatsoever. Other than that, the conclusions that we have based on the final production unit are exactly the same as what we had with the prototype. So to just quickly run you through the main points again, look, I mean, a lot of pedal stuff does really just come down to subjectivity. I would say the, uh, you know, the throttle and the clutch here are relatively unremarkable. There's nothing particularly special about them. They're smooth, they're quiet operation. They do exactly what they need to do. I like the design. I like the fact that they're using Hall Effect sensors as well. But look, there's plenty of other pedals on the market that are cheaper, that feel just as good. There's pedals that are a lot more expensive that feel pretty much just as good as well. And I think the important point here 
is that you know there is enough adjustment in the clutch pedal that you're not you know you're not forced to have that two stage feeling if you don't like that. But if you do want to have that there, then it can be dialed into your liking. And I, I can't see a scenario where anybody would be unhappy with the way the throttle and the clutch feel and the amount of adjustment which is available here. So really, the key differentiator here, and I think the the aspect of these pedals which most people are going to be basing their purchasing decision on is going to revolve around the brake. Now, as I said before, we've been really happy with the operation of the brake. Haven't had any issues with leakage or any maintenance, anything related to that at all. It literally was set and forget from the moment we set these up initially uh, in, in the case of the, uh, the prototype as well as these pedals. Absolutely no issues whatsoever there. Now, as we've said a couple of times throughout this review process, the brake is very stiff. There isn't a huge amount of adjustability available there. You can have that little bit of initial uptake adjusted in. You can use the softer elastomer if you wish to do so, but there isn't a whole lot that you can do to increase the amount of throw that's available here. So if you are after a pedal which gives you a nice long stroke, then these probably aren't going to be the pedals for you. But I think what has really surprised me throughout this process and something that's been reinforced through using these pedals for about two and a half months now is the fact that having that stiffer pedal with that, you know, that good amount of texture and that good amount of feeling there has really allowed me to dial in my braking and really establish good muscle memory. And I've found that, you know, the more different types of cars that I've driven, it really has adapted across to all those different cars. So I've done rally style driving, I've done formula, I've done GT, I've done street cars. And I can honestly tell you that everything that I've driven, I have been faster and more consistent since switching across to these pedals. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that these pedals are the fastest pedals on the market. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that being forced to use a stiffer pedal like this has forced me to appreciate what that actually brings to the table. And if I were to then go across and use a different set of pedals, and we actually did this when we tested the HPP JBV pedals recently on the channel, I initially went straight to a stiffer pedal than what I would have otherwise done prior to my experience using these pedals. So it's taught me that a stiffer pedal definitely means you know more stable and more consistent lap times at least for me personally other people may feel differently about that and that is perfectly fine but if you're after a stiffer brake pedal then this is definitely a fantastic set of pedals and definitely one that I think you should consider and for those watching this video that maybe aren't even interested in buying these pedals but just want to learn about them something that I would definitely recommend and something that I wish I'd done a long time ago is experiment with a stiffer pedal on some of the other pedal sets that I've been running for a long time because I have found so much really real world tangible benefit in doing so. So that is, I guess, really the, the big call out feature of these pedals is just that consistency, that feeling and that nice sort of texture that you get, even though you have such a short amount of throw here, combined with the reliability that we've had with these pedals, I really do think that they're a winner. So a couple of other things that have stood out to me, I really love the fact that there's absolutely no slop in the pedals whatsoever. Remember, we did say that you can dial in that little bit of initial uptake in the brake pedal if you wish to have it, but because we do have those return springs on all three pedals, just the same as what we'd have in a real life Tilton box like on a real life race car we don't have any slack in the pedals whatsoever and that is something that I have definitely appreciated in the time that I've been using this I really like the fact that they're completely toolless as well you don't need any tools to make basic adjustments to pitch preload and all those important things and I think the software package is really great as well I love the fact that everything can be adjusted right there on the fly in the software and another thing that I think definitely needs to be called out here is I really love the fact that the calibration for the pedals is actually stored on an e prom on the pedals themselves. What that means is if you take the pedals, install them on another rig, or you change some other piece of hardware, or jump between different sims, the calibration is going to feel exactly the same on every single sim. All you need to do is just push the pedal to its maximum, return it to its minimum, and the uh, calibration that's on the pedals will take care of the rest for you. That is so fundamentally important in you know establishing and maintaining muscle memory. The smallest little change can throw you out and make you start from scratch. So that is something that I've definitely appreciated, particularly in the context that we have here in the studio, where we're you know changing other bits of hardware all the time. It's something that's really frustrated us in the past, but something that we've really appreciated about these pedals. And overall, I love the simplicity of the design. I love that there's nothing really here that doesn't need to be here. I love that they've really put so much attention to detail into all the little tiny things that make a difference for sim races, from the rubber bump stops that we have on the returns now, you know, and I love the fact that they actually listened to the feedback that we had from them for them from the uh, from the prototype phase and made, uh, and made that adjustment. Same goes for the base plate as well. One of the things we called out with the prototype is we didn't like the idea of an open bottom where dirt and debris could potentially get into some of the electronic components, even though there aren't mechanical moving parts down there, which could be, you know, detrimentally affected by that. I just didn't like the idea of having, you know, potential moisture and dirt splashing around with electronics. So love that they've done that. They've really kind of just taken the time to listen to all those little things that I think will make a difference. And overall, the result is just a really well-refined product that doesn't seem like 
a first sim racing product from a company. I mean, a lot of the pedals that we reviewed here and a lot of the other sim racing products, it takes quite a few generations before we reach this level of quality. So to have something of this level be the very first product that they make, I think speaks volumes and definitely makes me excited for what we have in the future. Now we do know that they do have some load cell pedals coming very soon and we're definitely keen to get our hands on those to check out. We do have wheelbases coming, we've got all sorts of different things. Their vision is to have a complete ecosystem as we saw in the software earlier, which will basically have all the key bases covered for sim racing and all be you know configurable within the one software package, which I think is something that's very exciting as well. There's nothing more frustrating than having to have 15 different software packages is running to get all the bits and pieces of hybrid on your sim rig running. So very exciting times for sim racing, really happy with the Invicta pedals and I'm sure any of you guys that have ordered these or are thinking about ordering them will be very happy with them too. Just to keep in mind that if you do like to have a longer stroke on your brake pedal then these maybe aren't the pedals for you. They're not going to be a one size fits all, they don't make any excuses for that, they are intentionally a hard pedal but if these do what you want then I do think that they're a really fantastic option. So I hope this video has helped you guys out. If you do want to pick a set of these pedals up or any other products that we reviewed here on the channel. There are links down in the description below as well as links to some of our other review videos. We we'll definitely recommend checking out our first look video at the prototypes of these as well where we had a bit of a longer discussion around the driving experience on these. But hopefully this has helped you guys out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. Make sure you sub to the channel as well so you don't miss future reviews and content. And yeah guys, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again soon. Bye.